Do you mind if I take my mask off? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. no. Right. Should be live. Do you think I could sit down? Would yes, be all right? absolutely. Yeah, if you want to do that, that's okay. Okay. You know, I mean, it's like if we were going to do this, like we're all going, like I'm reading your bedtime story. It feels like we should be. Don't see. And if we don't want to pretend we're in bed, but no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's okay. Now you can't see me. They don't need to see me because it's all about the story, right? Yeah. <laughs> and she was asking about the lights too. Yes. Oh, is it, is it possible to make yep. it any more? Yep. yep. We'll do. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bedtime. Well, I, what a wonderful, look, sleepy looking group of people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, um, for being, you know, okay with the change. I feel like it was way too rough and um, my son was having some, some, we won't go over there. <laughs> Issues. <laughs> and uh, and I was helping him out. And But it, it just wouldn't have been the right vibe. We would have had to um, lie on the floor. <laughs> so anyway, I feel people have been asking me over the last couple of days, like, so the bedtime stories, what is that going to be? And I feel like um, if I was as clever as nearly everybody else except me on the Joko is, <laughs> I would do something ironic and clever and, but actually I was just gonna read bedtime stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, my, a little bit of background, my, um, my mother's English and I was raised are there English people with other English parents? Yes. <laughs> I feel for you. <laughs> um, but uh, sort of, I don't know if we'd had bedtime stories, but we had stories, you know, she would, she would read. And it was my favorite part of the day. And um, I have to say that when I became a mother, I didn't quite realize how much I would really enjoy reading the stories. And the thing is, I find that I have to read them with, you know, my... English, American, Canadian hybrid accent that I have. <laughs> um, but all the characters have to be have an English accent. So just so you know what's going on, and that's why I'm so mid-Atlantic, so in case you're confused. So um, I have a collection of stories here, and I thought actually I would start with the stories, and then at the end we might sing a bedtime song, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> if that's not too embarrassing. Um, uh, let's see, so, um, what should we start with? We're going to start with, what should we start with? Mr. Impossible. <laughs> you comfy? Okay, I'm going to get comfy. All right. I've never done this before. Usually only to an audience of my son and my little nieces and nephews. <laughs> okay, so of course you can't see the pictures, but I don't think it matters. Mr. Impossible could do the most amazing things. For instance, Mr. Impossible could jump over a house. You try it. It's impossible. And Mr. Impossible could make himself invisible. All he had to do was stand there and think about becoming invisible, and he became invisible. You try it. It's impossible. And Mr. Impossible could fly. All he had to do was stand there and flap his arms around, and off he flew. You try it. Impossible. It's impossible! <laughs> One day, Mr. Impossible was out walking in the woods when he met a boy named William. William was on his way to school. Hello, said Mr. Impossible. Hello, replied William. I'm William. I'm impossible, said Mr. Impossible. Really, said William. Really, smiled Mr. Impossible. Can you do impossible things, asked William. Haven't come across anything I couldn't do, 
replied Mr. Impossible, modestly. William thought, can you climb that tree? He asked, pointing to the biggest tree in the woods. I can do better than that, replied Mr. Impossible. I can walk up that tree. And he did. William thought again. Can you stand on one hand? He asked. I can do better than that, replied Mr. Impossible. I can stand on no hands. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> That's impossible, cried William. True, replied Mr. Impossible. Then William remembered that he was on his way to school. Why don't you come with me? He asked. But I've never been to a school before, Mr. Impossible said. Well, then it's time you did, said William. Come on. William and Mr. Possible sat at the back of William's classroom with all the other children. The teacher came in, but didn't notice that there was anybody extra in his class that morning. Good morning, children, said the teacher. I have a very difficult math problem for you to do today. It will take you most of the morning to work out the answer. He wrote the problem on the blackboard. It really was the most difficult problem William had ever seen in his entire life. Full of multiplications and divisions and additions and other things that William did not enjoy. The teacher was right. It would indeed take most of the morning to work out the answer, if not most of the afternoon as well. Mr. Impossible whispered in William's ear. William put up his hand. Yes, William, said the teacher. Is there something about the problem you don't understand? Excuse me, sir, said William. Is the answer 23? <laughs> the teacher was very, absolutely, totally, completely amazed. How did you work out the answer so quickly? It's impossible. Nothing is impossible, said Mr. Impossible from the back of the class, and he stood up. Well, I never exclaimed the teacher. See the teacher. <laughs> After that, Mr. Impossible spent all day at the school. He showed the teacher how he could read a book upside down. That's impossible, said the children who were watching. Absolutely, replied Mr. Impossible. Then, William asked Mr. Impossible if he would like to play in the school kickball game. Oh, yes, please, replied Mr. Impossible. I've never played kickball before. And do you know what he did? He kicked the ball so high into the air that when it came down, it had snow on it. <laughs> what an impossible thing to do. Then it was time to go home. Mr. Impossible said goodbye to all the people at the school, and then he said goodbye to William. Goodbye, Mr. Impossible, said William. Goodbye, William, said Mr. Impossible, and he just disappeared. William rubbed his eyes, and he went home. William's mother and father were waiting for him. Hello, William. Did you have a good day at school? Yes, replied William. And I met somebody who can do anything in the world. Really, William, you're impossible, they both laughed. William smiled and he went inside. And a hundred miles away, a small figure was listening to what William's mother and father were saying. And he grinned an impossible grin. And then he went to sleep, standing on his head. And we all know that's impossible. I don't know why I like that one so much. There's all the, you know, all of these stories. Some of them are really, like, they just don't work in the modern day. <laughs> but this one does. And um, uh, anyway, I've had these since I was a kid, so. <laughs> all right, that was Mr. Impossible. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> The goal here is to send you to, you'll be either fall asleep because you're really tired or because you're really bored. <laughs> but either way works. 
All right. I'm going to let you choose next. We have um, all the Paddingtons. And we also have something that is not English, but which is my son's favorite story, and he insisted that I bring it. Dragons love tacos. <laughs> Should we do that one next? <laughs> this one is not English at all. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Um, Dragons love tacos. <laughs> I think that a lot of people here love tacos too. Yeah. Yeah. And, dragons. and dragons. And there's a lot of dragons here. <laughs> hey kid, did you know that dragons love tacos? They love beef tacos and chicken tacos. They love really big gigantic tacos and tiny, tiny little baby tacos as well. I wish you could see the drawings on this one. This is such a great book. <laughs> Some people can see it. There we go. I'll we'll just read it this way. <laughs> a of experimental children's book reading. Why do dragons love tacos? Maybe it's the smell from the sizzling pan. Maybe it's the crunch of the crispy tortillas. Maybe it's a secret. Either way, if you want to make friends with dragons, tacos are key. Hey dragons, why do you guys love tacos so much? <laughs> but wait, as much as dragons love tacos, they hate spicy salsa even more. They hate spicy green salsa and spicy red salsa. They hate spicy chunky salsa and spicy smooth salsa. If the salsa is spicy at all, dragons can't stand it. Why do dragons hate spicy salsa? Well, just one drop of hot sauce makes a dragon's ears smoke. Just one single speck of hot pepper makes a dragon snort sparks. Spicy salsa gives dragons the tummy troubles, and when dragons get the tummy troubles, so oh boy. <laughs> if you want to make tacos for dragons, keep the tacos, keep the toppings mild. Tomatoes, check. Lettuce, check. Cheese, check. These are all good toppings for tacos for dragons. Hey dragon. How do you feel about spicy taco toppings? Mm. Spicy? Not spicy. <laughs> no tacos. That was like not half and half, so I'm curious. Like <laughs> Those of you who said no spicy and those who said yes spicy, what's the other choice? <laughs> okay, all right. Dragons love parties. They like costume parties mm -hmm. and pool parties. They like big gigantic parties with accordions and tiny little parties with charades. Why do dragons love parties? Maybe it's the conversation, maybe it's the dancing, maybe it's the comforting sound of a good friend's laughter. The only things dragons love more than parties or tacos is taco parties. <laughs> taco parties are parties with lots of tacos. If you want to have some dragons over for a taco party, you'll need buckets of tacos, pant loads of tacos. The best way to judge is to get a boat and fill the boat with tacos. <laughs> That's about how many tacos dragons need for a taco party. After all, dragons love tacos. I didn't quite realize how appropriate for this. Yeah. <laughs> hey dragon, are you excited for the big taco party? Yeah. Yes! Yes, very excited. Just remember, dragons hate spicy salsa 
Before you host your taco party with dragons, get rid of all the spicy salsa. In fact, bury the spicy salsa in the backyard so the dragons can't find it. Oh wow, these dragons, they love your taco party. They love the music, they love the decorations, they especially love the tacos. Congratulations. It's a good thing you got rid of all that spicy... Uh-oh. Wait a second. What are those little green things in the salsa? You didn't read the fine print? Totally mild salsa. No. With spicy jalapeno peppers. <laughs> 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 We've all made that mistake at Trader Joe's. <laughs> Dragons, listen to me. Do not eat those tacos. Those little green specks in the salsa? Those are jalapeno peppers. They are super spicy. I know you love tacos, Dragons, but you are not going to like those tacos. Do not let those dragons eat those tacos. Crunch, 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 it's a post-apocalyptic landscape. <laughs> Why would dragons help you rebuild your house? Maybe they're good Samaritans. Maybe they feel bad for wrecking it. Maybe they're just in it for the taco breaks. <laughs> There's a little table of tacos. After all, dragons love tacos. Yeah. <laughs> Have there been any taco parties on the boat? Yeah. A little bit. Not this year. Not this year. Not this year. So many tacos for dinner. It's awesome. taco shells, though. Yeah, they're really good. All right. Well, I'll read a Paddington and then we can sing a song, and maybe you'll all be really tired. Are you getting sleepy? Yeah, I'm not getting sleepy. <laughs> I'm just going to pour some tea. I discovered that if I, I could convince room service to bring me a teapot, and then I put a sign on it telling them not to take it. And then this is my teapot for the whole cruise. <laughs> well, I mean, I changed the tea. <laughs> it's not the same tea in the teapot. <laughs> but you've probably noticed they don't have teapots in the, you know. So. All right. Would you like to have the first Paddington or Paddington's Garden or both? Garden. 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 That's my favorite one. One morning, Paddington went out into the garden and began making a list of all the nice things he could think about being a bear and living at 32 Windsor Gardens. He had a room of his own, and a warm bed to sleep in, and he had marmalade for breakfast every morning. In darkest Peru, he'd only been allowed to have marmalade on Sundays. The list was soon so long, he had nearly run out of paper, before he realized that he had left out one of the very nicest things of all. The garden itself. Paddington liked the Browns' garden. Apart from the occasional noise from a nearby building site, it was so quiet and peaceful, it didn't feel, feel like being in London at all. But nice gardens don't just happen. They usually require a lot of hard work. 
and the one at number 32 Windsor Gardens was no exception. Mr. Brown had to mow the lawn twice a week, and Mrs. Brown was kept busy weeding the flower beds. There was always something to do. Even Mrs. Bird lent a hand whenever she had a spare moment. It was Mrs. Bird who first suggested giving Jonathan, Judy, and Paddington each a piece of the garden. It will keep certain bears out of mischief, she said, and it will be fun for Jonathan and Judy as well. Mr. Brown agreed that it was a very good idea, and he marked out three plots at the far end of the lawn. Paddington was most excited. I don't suppose there are many bears who have their own garden, he exclaimed. Early the next morning, all three set out to work. Judy decided to make a flower bed, and Jonathan had his eye on some old paving stones. Paddington didn't know what to do. In the past, he'd often found that gardening was much harder than it looked, especially when you only had paws. In the end, armed with a jar of Mrs. Bird's homemade marmalade, he borrowed Mrs. Brown's wheelbarrow and set off to look for ideas. His first stop was a stall in the market where he bought a book called How to Plan Your Garden by Lionel Trug. In the same, you know, it came complete with a large packet of assorted seeds and if the picture on the front cover was anything to go by, it was no wonder Mr. Trug looked happy for he seemed to do most of his planning while lying in a hammock. By the end of the book, without lifting a finger, he was surrounded by blooms Paddington decided this was very good value indeed, especially when the owner of the stall gave him a two pence in change. Mr. Trug's book was full of useful hints and tips. The first one suggested that before starting work, it was a good idea to close your eyes and try to picture what the garden would look like when it was finished. Having walked into a lamp post by mistake, Paddington decided to read another page or two and there he found a much better idea. Mr. Trug advised standing back and looking at the site from a safe distance, preferably somewhere high up. Paddington knew just the spot. By the time Paddington reached the building site near the Browns' house, it was the middle of the morning and the men were all on their tea break. Placing his jar of marmalade on a wooden platform for safekeeping, he sat on a pile of bricks for the rest for a rest while he considered the matter. There was no one about, and there was a ladder nearby. Mr. Trug was quite right. The Brown's garden did look very different from high up. But before he had time to get his breath back, Paddington heard the sound of an engine starting up. He peered through a gap in the floorboards. As he did so, his eyes nearly popped out. On the ground, just below him, a man was emptying a load of concrete onto the very spot where he had left his jar of marmalade. Paddington scrambled back down the ladder as fast as his legs would carry him, reaching the bottom just as the foreman came around the corner. Is anything wrong? said the man. You look upset. My jaw's been buried! exclaimed Paddington, pointing to the pile of concrete. It had some of Mrs. Bird's best golden chunks in it. I won't ask how your jaw got there, said the foreman, turning to Paddington as his men set to work clearing the concrete into small piles, or what you were doing up on the ladder. I'm glad of that, said Paddington, politely raising his hat. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, there was a whirring sound from somewhere overhead, and to Paddington's surprise, the platform landed at his feet. My marmalade! he exclaimed thankfully. Your marmalade? Did you say marmalade? said the foreman. That's right, said Paddington. I put it there ready for my elevensies. <laughs> elevensies. <laughs> it must have been... Just so you know, I have elevensies every day. So, but it, it's a, such a funny word. It must have been taken up there by mistake, and now the tops come off. It was the foreman's turn to look as though he thought, as though he could hardly believe his eyes. 
That special quick drying in cement. It's probably rock hard already, ruined by a bear's marmalade. No one will give me tuppence for it now. I will, said Paddington. I've had an idea. Paddington was busy for the rest of the week. When the builders saw the rock garden that he'd made, they were most impressed, and the foreman even gave him some plants to finish it off until his seeds started to grow. It's National Garden Day on Saturday. There's some very famous people judging. I'll spread the word around. You never know your luck. The foreman was as good as his word. And on Saturday, half the neighborhood turned up at number 32 Windsor Gardens to see the judges arrive. Paddington nearly fell over backwards with surprise when he discovered that no less a person than Mr. Lionel Trug himself was leading the procession. It's very good of you to get up out of your hammock, Mr. Trug, he said. <laughs> uh, not at all, said Mr. Trug. My pleasure, I must say. I do love your orange stones. Where did you find them? Oh, I didn't, said Paddington. I think they rather found me, thanks to the builders. Congratulations, said Mr. Trug, as he handed Paddington a gold star. It's so good to see a young bear taking up gardening. I do hope that you will be the first of many. Who would have believed it, said Mr. Brown, as the last of the crowd departed. Oh, you must write and tell Aunt Lucy all about it, said Mrs. Bird. They'll be very excited in the home for retired bears when they get the news. Paddington thought that was a good idea, but he had something to do first. He wanted to add one more important item to his list of all the nice things there were about being a bear and living with the Browns. Having my own rock garden. And then he signed his name and added his special paw print just to show that it was genuine. The end. Are you sleepy? All right. If my son was not asleep yet, then we would resort to a song. <laughs> That's a last resort. And it was uh, kind of an infinite song, and it was based on what he was most interested in, which at the time was heavy machinery. And so the song goes like this, and I'm going to need your help for it. And we'll just uh, fade it out until you're all sleepy, and then we can go off to bed. And... Um, the, uh, basically, you have to think of things that should go to sleep and call them out and then they can work their way into the song. For example, if it was him and if he was five, which he's not, and he's 11, and would be very embarrassed that I'm talking about any of this, so don't mention it to him if you see him. Um, it would, goes like this. It goes, go to sleep, go to sleep, all the dumb drugs are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep, and I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep, all the backhoes are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep, and I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep. Go to sleep, all the dolphins are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep, and I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep, all the, all the kittens are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep. All the jet skis. <laughs> Wait, I need to get my ears on. Jet all, skis. all the jet skis are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep. 
go to sleep. All the people with insomnia are <laughs> sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep. All the, all the kraken are sleeping. It's kraken plural. Krakens, krakeny. <laughs> all the kraken are sleeping. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep. All the Jonathan Coltons are sleeping. All of them go to sleep, go to sleep. And I'll see you in... You didn't think there was only one. In the morning. Go to sleep, go to sleep. All the... Dress partiers. All the dress partiers are asleep. I doubt it. Yeah. Sleeping. Go to sleep. <laughs> Go to sleep. And I'll see you in the morning. Go to sleep. <laughs> night, night, everybody. <laughs> Sweet dreams.